Hey friends, it's Scapegoat Saturday. My name's Jess, I'm a therapist and a coach and a scapegoat from a narcissistic family. And this video, I'm gonna give seven reasons when I think you shouldn't take on power of attorney for somebody else. Stay tuned. Hi folks, welcome back. So power of attorney is something that we can often come into contact with when our parents are getting older. Power of attorney is a quite a common thing for people to put in place as they age. And the idea is it's basically this legal document that gives someone else the authority to make decisions on their behalf. It might be blanket, it might just be specific to, okay, you can sign my banking documents or you can make healthcare decisions for me. So the power of attorney can vary from person to person, but it's a very common thing that people put in place. But it's very common for people to put them in place, especially as they're navigating old age and they're concerned about their capacity to make good decisions. So wonderful, it's, they're there for a good reason and they're really helpful for a lot of people. The challenge we can have is when we're in toxic, difficult families and or we have narcissistic or other parents who have severe mental illnesses where it can become a bit of a minefield. So I'm gonna give you seven red flags when I would really, really think about staying well clear of power of attorney. And if you are navigating this, stay tuned to the end because I'll give you some workarounds if, you, if you're feeling stuck. So my first red flag for not taking on power of attorney is if you feel you can't say no. When we feel obligated, when we feel pressured, when we feel it is absolutely expected to, and we kind of, we're feeling uneasy about it, but we think if I say no, things will get worse, things will be more difficult. That to me is just the biggest red flag. Your gut is telling you this does not feel like a good idea to me. And so if you're feeling pressured, then please listen to those warning bells. My second red flag is pretty strong as well. If you have been or you are being abused by this person, if it's an abusive relationship, you do not want to take power of attorney. For me, that's a solid line in the sand. So whatever the type of abuse, it could be physical, it could be mental, it could be financial, it could be emotional, it doesn't matter. If someone is abusing you, if someone is being that disrespectful, if someone thinks it's okay to to harm you, for me it would be too unsafe to go into that situation, the lines are blurred, it's too complicated, it would get messy. So that for me is a, is a real hard no. So red flag number three for me is we should think very carefully about taking on a power of attorney if we think it's going to be emotionally, mentally, physically or financially draining, difficult or harmful for us. We're kind of going in that grey area of maybe is it an abusive relationship, is it really just very difficult, toxic sometimes. Where does difficult relationships stop and abusive relationships start? It's that gray area. So even if you think, you know what, it's not, I've, I wouldn't class it as abuse, but you're still thinking, oh my God, how would I handle it? How would I cope with it all? And the weight feels, just feels so heavy. I would really think about that very carefully. So my fourth red flag is something that we need to be really honest about from our perspective as well. I would say it is inappropriate for us to be a power of attorney for somebody else if we are unable to separate our, our needs, and this could also be our emotional needs, from the needs of the person who we are taking care of. It can be a hard one, especially if we've grown up in quite an enmeshed family and, and we have maybe a history of codependency or we just have blurry boundaries. 
but really our job as a power of attorney is to take a step back and think well what's the right thing for this person as a as a as a caring adult who who wants the best for this individual can i i need to put aside what i need and any history and any arguments or difficulties we have to really think about what's best for them and can i do that and we, I think we all like to think that we can, but sometimes the history, difficult histories with, our, with, with hard relationships can mean that our objectivity really is a really difficult thing to maintain. And if that's going to kind of interfere, it's going to be kind of noise when we have to make these decisions or we're asked to do, do something or step in and, and, and help, is that going to interfere with our abilities to be able to to do and un complete our duties under the power of attorney? Okay, so fifth red flag, and this is another really big one, is when we're looking at being a joint power of attorney with someone we've had a really fractious relationship with, a really difficult relationship with. So this part might not be around the person who's asking us to be the power of attorney, but it might be more around who the other person is that we need to work with. So joint powers of attorney are when there's not just one person signing off, but, but there are two, one, two people making big decisions just to kind of keep that checks and check and balance in there, which, which is, makes a lot of sense. But if the person that you're being asked to kind of to work with, a co-worker or a colleague on this, however you want to kind of look at it in your head, often it's a family member or maybe another sibling. If that is a difficult, a toxic or abusive relationship for you again, or if you've got a, just a really difficult history with this person, then it's it's a tough one it's really thinking about what do we need and can we put ourselves in a position where we have to work through something for potentially a long period of time with someone who we really really struggle with in that situation i would look for a second alternative so again stay tuned because i have some ideas that might help so my sixth red flag is when we have been told we're going to do it or we're expected to do it and we aren't asked when the person who wants us to take to be their power of attorney doesn't doesn't consult us and we don't have a conversation about and a respectful conversation they just assume um it's just for me it's it's a sign of disrespect it's a sign of taking making a lot of assumptions about the relationship and really that symptom of a relationship where we don't talk and we don't have meaningful conversations if you can't have a conversation around respectful conversation around would you like to take it on what does it look like what would it mean if we can't have that conversation then how are we going to be able to navigate some potentially difficult calls gray areas in the future that's right for this person i just for me it again it kind of sets us up on us on a path for failure later on so i would i would want to avoid this one too so my last reason is that i would avoid power of attorney on my own if i was being asked by someone who had a significant mental illness or a personality an addiction or a personality disorder. When we're dealing with someone who has got a history of making bad decisions and or they're difficult to have a relationship with or, or it's been a roller coaster and we can just feel that, oh my gosh, how am I gonna navigate this? It's just one more thing. In that, again, in that situation, I would really think about saying no or finding, an, a, again, another workaround that might help this person. And I can see morally it, it, it can be difficult, especially if we've, we can see that this person is really gonna need help and we want to we want to be there to, to support them. But we have to, again, we have to make sure that we are looking after ourselves so that we can look after that other person. Mm -hmm. 
So what do we do then? Okay, Chess, great. I've, I've ticked or potentially ticked a couple of your red flags here or, or just one, but I'm, I still feel like I should do it or I need to do it or there's nobody else to do it. Who else is going to do it? Well, let's be clear about this. First of all, we don't have any obligation. There are no shoulds, there are no musts. There might be ideas in our family that say otherwise, but there is no absolute obligation. And as I kind of said before, if we feel obligated, then potentially we are the wrong person to do it because we might not be able to be as objective and as helpful and as sensible because we might be required to make really tough decisions and we need to make sure that we're able to do that. So some workarounds are number one, get a second power of attorney in. So we're not just the only person and that second power of attorney is someone we, we trust and we can rely on and that we know we're gonna be able to work with and, and be able to lean on to make these difficult decisions. And so then my second workaround is that having that person, that second person as a professional. It could be a lawyer, it could be potentially someone with specific medical uh, abilities in this area. But having someone with specific expertise or someone that you know is going to be able to keep things kind of on the legit, on the straight and narrow, and making sure that that if we have any concerns about, oh, I kind of want to do it, but I am a little worried that it might, you know, would it, I, I want to keep myself safe. Then having that, that backup power of attorney, I think is a very sensible and reasonable thing to do. My third option is, actually I, I'm gonna add in a bonus one, my third one is, is just say no. That's, that is a workaround that we are absolutely allowed to do and some of us forget. So that's the obvious one. And my fourth one is, again, if you're not sure, having an open and honest conversation with the person who's asking you and saying, look, I, I see that you want me to do it and I appreciate the responsibility that it is. And maybe we can phrase it, say something like, I want to do it, but I have some concerns about my ability to do it. And we actually set out and state with this person and we might want to do it in writing if, if we think it would be needed in the future or if other family members would need it or, but setting out in writing, okay, these, if I might, this is the situation or I reserve the right to change my mind if I feel that I can't do it properly. And so just to kind of wrap this up, we can, if we've said yes, we can change our minds and say no. And I believe we can, we can do it any time in the process and, and appoint somebody else if we feel that we're not doing the right thing or we're not able to do the right thing or we have obstacles to be able to do it properly. So I guess my last point is then, but it might be useful to set that up ahead of time so that we don't end up down the line with kind of what we were worried about or a worst case scenario or our mental health is really struggling and but we've said yes and now we've got other people saying well you said yes and now you're not doing it and also if we feel that we need to have a solid out or just an out in general that if we need to kind of pull the plug that we feel that we can do so. So friends, please let me know what you think. If you've got any stories around this, any experience, any other red flags, any thoughts on whether you would do it or you wouldn't do it, please drop us all a line in the, in the comments below. It helps us all learn from other people's experiences. If you like the video, thumbs up, subscribe, notifications, all the usual stuff. You can check out my blog on this topic and if you are still like, oh, I'm just not quite sure, then I do one-on-one -on -one consultations and coaching as well. So just check out the website and give me a shout. Please take care, my friends, and I will talk to you very soon. Bye for now.